Today we're going to talk about food security and food supply. Um, come on in, fill in, folks. There's, there's space available. There's even a couple together if you're snuggly with the person next to you. So one of the first things that we always, well, I guess that I always hear in the prepper community or the emergency preparedness community, as we prefer to be called, we actually hate the name preppers. Who here is a prepper? Who considers yourself a prepper? Darn it. <laughs> Schmuck. <laughs> I'm a self-reliant Self-reliant person. I'm a, I'm a self-sufficiency advocate. How about that? I like to be self-sufficient, do things for myself. My wife says it's a control freak. I like to call it self-sufficiency. Um, I don't like being called a prepper because that brings to mind the doomsday, end of the world things. And what I have found with my family and my life is that stuff happens a lot and it's not necessarily neighborhood community wide it can be family local and one of the things that has saved our our family on more occasions than are not was having food security being able to feed my family even when i wasn't working for two years losing a job something like that that can be just as bad if not a worse disaster than an earthquake or a hurricane or a flood or mudslides or wildfire so what we really want to talk about today is some of the misconceptions that a lot of people who are into emergency preparedness have about food security. So who in here has had the thought, well, if something happens and there's not food in Smith's and Lynn's and Walmart, I'll just go hunting and get food. <laughs> have you heard that before? Sure. Oh, I know how to hunt. I can feed my family. So a few of the things we're going to talk about today are fictions and misconceptions about food security. What to eat. Not just, and you're thinking, oh, wow, food, duh, that's kind of a no-brainer. But you're going to find that uh, after today's information that what you eat really is important. Not just calorie count, but what kind of calories you're getting. Um, Short-term versus long-term food storage. Who's ever thought about short-term food storage? Yeah? Okay. Usually when you hear food storage, you're thinking 25 years life, shelf life, right? Well, there's actually a lot of things that you need to change about your mindset about food storage for short-term food supply. Um, how to store it and where. <laughs> um, and the last one's gonna be food prep in the emergency. And when you don't have the resources we're used to having, Sometimes it's hard to make food that we're used to making. Um, so some myth conceptions. I'll hunt and fish for food. Oh, good heavens, it didn't save it. Shame on me. I made these slides this morning. That's why I was late coming out here. Um, hopefully I saved the rest of them. The 2016 census for Iron County. Are you guys ready for this? 49,000 people. I moved here thinking city or city in Iron County was a small rural area. But in the last 12 years since I've been here, Iron County has grown tremendously. Uh, Iron County was 49,000 people. Cedar City, I wanna say was 31,000 people. Enoch was like 6,800 people. Um, Perrin was 27. Gosh darn, I forget, it's all on the census stuff that I pulled up here on my computer beforehand. Um, but there's about 49,000 people just in Iron County. So counting Cedar, Enoch, Perwin, Paraguna, Hamilton Fort, Cedar Highland now, because they're officially a city. Uh, all of us out there in three peaks that, you know, that hold that don't tread on me flag above our, our houses, because we don't want to be part of anybody. Um, there's a lot of us here in Iron County. And when I was talking to some of the local grocery stores and stuff in preparation for today's class, I asked them, how much food do we go through as a week as a community? How many shipments, how many tons of food do you bring in each week to keep the shelves stocked? Any guesses? How many times a shipment comes in? A whole bunch. A whole bunch. What's that? Every three days. Every three days? That's, that's about right. It's about two to three a week, depending on which week it is, what, what type of season it is. 
Any idea how much food is on those trucks? Full. Full. Each that's store. Not that's not just that's one. It's exactly right. The question was, the, the comment was made, that's each store is getting two to three shipments a week. And it's usually two to three trailers per store. So on an average, we're getting 12 to 15 semi-trailers of food coming in to Cedar City each week to feed us. That, yes, ma'am. And that probably doesn't count the uh, people, the other, like, the people who drink potato chips and the other ones. That's, that's big trucks you're talking That's about. big trucks coming from like main distributors where and Smith's has a main warehouse. The small, people. the small little vendors, yeah. Um, and the other thing is, if you go to the store real early in the morning or real late at night and watch how empty the shelves are, then, you know, that's a, on an every day, not just every, every day. Every day, it would be really freaky because those are things that people consume every day. Every day. It doesn't include fast food and restaurants. That's what I was about to say. That's not including any of the restaurants or fast food places here in town. And most families eat, eat out a least lot. Four times a week. At least four to five times a week. So that's just the grocery stores. People buying week, two week supplies of groceries. How many times do you guys go to the grocery store a week? Anybody here go once a month? Good for you. Every two weeks? Every week? All right, three or four times a week. <laughs> it depends. It depends. <laughs> Fresh vegetables, stuff like that. They have a lot of kids. Oh, good heavens. I, I, I hate going to Smith's or, or Lynn's and shopping because I come out with a cart full of stuff. And that's not on case lot days. Because <laughs> I've got three kids and they're all teenagers and two of them are boys and they eat me out of house and home. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we do once a month on our main shop. We mm -hmm. then for milk and bread. And milk and your perishables, right? Yeah. So what I want you to get to thinking about is when something happens to interrupt our food supply, um, a trucker strike, power outages, gas prices go up, any of these things are very common, simple things, not to mention a big disaster. Um, if something happened to our food supply, how long would we last? How long would the shelves at the grocery store stay full? When I was down in Florida, we, we did relief to New Orleans when uh, the hurricane hit down there. Do you know how long food stayed on the shelves in New Orleans? Less than 24 hours. Within 24 hours, every single store that was uh, ransackable was ransacked. How long did the food last after it got out? With no refrigeration, no cooling, no electricity, no gas to prepare it. It didn't last at all. So within three days, everything that was perishable perished, including people. Because we're perishable, right? So just keep that in mind. There's a lot of people here. So hunting and fishing, while a great recreational sport is not a way to support our families long term. Oh, it did not save. Okay. Oh, that's too bad. So I'm not going to use slides. It's going to come from my head again. So you guys ready? Well, keep the, the main topics up so I don't lose my place. All right. So what to eat in calorie count and nutrition. Anybody know what the average daily consumption in calories is? Okay. That's what I was about to bring up. So normal. Who in here is normal? Anybody here normal? I saw one hand go up. He's pretty, he's pretty confident that he's normal. Okay, the USDA says that the average normal calorie consumption per day should be about 2,000 calories per day. And I can't spell. I... I didn't do it as a kid, and the more languages you learn, the worse your English gets. So my English is terrible. So normal calorie intake per day to maintain life, normal healthy functioning, is about 2,000 calories a day. Any idea how much the average American eats? Yep. 3,500 to 4,000 a day. And they wonder why we have an obesity problem, okay? <coughs> 
Now, out of that food that we eat, where do our calories come from? Any clue? Carbs. What else? Sugar's a carb. Protein. One more. Fat. And let me tell you, as a science teacher <laughs> that's taught human body health related stuff for 10 years, this is pretty much all we are. We are fat, we are proteins, and we are carbohydrates. And one more. Water. Water. So how much of this does our body need? How much of each ratio, the right mix, do we need? <coughs> well, we have found that to lose weight, they say these low fat, low carb diets, high protein, right? <coughs> you guys heard that? Yes. So we want low, low, oop, high, and high. This is to get that nice, wonderfully shaped, chiseled body that nobody ever really has unless they cheat. That's my opinion, okay? Low carbs, low fat, high protein, and lots and lots of water. What do we really eat? High, low, high, low the exact opposite of what we're supposed to. Most of our, the American diet consists of highly processed, high carbohydrate, high fat, because it tastes good. Low protein, because that's expensive, and we, don't, we never drink enough water. So, what do you think we should eat in a emergency situation? Nutrient dense, I like that phrase. Donuts. Nutrient <laughs> dense. Okay, I heard donuts. There is, you're gonna laugh. There is a time and place for donuts, chocolate, uh, things like that in your emergency food supply. Okay, it's called comfort food. Mood enhancers. Mood enhancers. I don't know about you, but when I sit down for a brownie with vanilla ice cream and a glass of milk, I'm happy. <laughs> when you're in high stress environments, you're going to need comfort food. So plan to have chocolate, donuts, sweets, Twinkies, peanut butter. peanut butter. They don't have expiration dates. Chocolate lasts for forever. Twinkies, the FDA doesn't even make them put an expiration date on the package. And they put expiration date on everything. <laughs> Twinkies never expire. It's, they're, all they're all formaldehyde and plastic, but it tastes good. It makes us happy. So there is a place for comfort food in your emergency preparedness food. But nutrient dense, give me an example of some nutrients dense foods. Come on, you guys are not fresh, brand fresh. new to this, right? Fresh stuff like lettuce. Sprout. Okay, oh, sprouts, okay. I brought up lettuce because lettuce is almost no nutritional value. Nuts and seeds. Nuts and seeds. What else? Meat. Meat. Ugh. Carnivores. Fat. What's that? Fat. Fat. Good Thank fat. you. Good fats. Bacon. Bacon. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but bacon is my comfort food. Okay. When I'm having bacon, I'm happy. Other nutrients dense foods. Lentils. Lentils, yes. And grain and grains. grains. What's that look like? This list: vegetables, meat, fat, grains, and legumes. It's like a farm, doesn't it? Hmm? It's like a hamburger. It's like a hamburger. <laughs> it's like a hamburger to me. This is a garden, folks. 
if you're not gardening in the space that you have now, and it doesn't take much space to garden, you're not eating healthy. Yes, sir. Well, you know, going back to your uh, misconceptions going on with the, I'll hunt and fish to eat, there's no one about, I'll start a garden. Oh, I, oh, who here gardens at home? How many years <laughs> did it take before you figured out how to grow the right vegetables in the right soil with the right combination of augmentations, compost, fertilizer, pesticides, whatever, before you started to get something out of your garden? I love seeing these survival cans of seeds. There's a survival vault of seeds. Oh, I'll just buy that and when food runs out, I'll plant a garden. How long does it take to get food out of a garden? Two months. Short stuff, two months. Long stuff, four months. How long is our growing season in Cedar City? 135 days. <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to give me an exact days. It's about plus or minus three weeks. Plus, plus or minus three weeks. It might snow in June and be 70 degrees in January. About four months. Just a little over, a little less than four months here in Cedar City. So whenever you get seeds to plant a garden, make sure that maturity date on those plants is less than 120 days. Yes, ma'am. Um, just, <clears throat> I know our, the, our ideal growing season is only four months, but I have grown um, spinach and chard and... Cabbage and broccoli kale. and kale and, and had to go all through the winter. Yes, ma'am. Especially winters like a model like this. My garden is still producing kale and spinach and onions and everything and it's sitting out in the backyard. Yes, sir. I get my starts, I start my starts in the house, put them in a windowsill so they get light and they stay warm in the house. Mm -hmm. So I get a jump on the growing season. So when it's finally warm enough outside and I plant them. They're already partly grown. Right. Which gives you a real big head start. And you're thinking, oh, but it takes a greenhouse to do all of that. No, it doesn't. And even if it does, you can put a greenhouse in your backyard. And a really simple one is called a cold frame. You put it on a south facing side of your garage or a fence or something like that. And you would be amazed at the food that you can grow out of that little greenhouse. Her first. I, I had spinach that was covered in snow and it was all wilted and stuff. The sun, I just pulled the snow back, the sun would come out and if I, if I picked it when it was wilted, then it would stay, stay wilted. But if I waited until the sun came out in the afternoon and picked it, it was just as crisp. Perked and right up. As any time. Yes, sir. I have raised garden beds. Uh-huh, me too. Put translucent plastic over them, and it helps trap the heat and keep the soil warm. Yep, and while this is not a gardening class, um, <laughs> um, Albert Montoya, who's a master gardener, is gonna be teaching a few of our garden series stuff. So gardening, there are tons of things you can do to extend, even at our altitude and elevation, in a desert to extend your gardening year round, okay? They had, uh, there's a gardening technique called wallapinis where you bury most of your greenhouse and just have the top sticking up that they used in the mountains in South America at about 15,000 feet where it's cold year round. And they were growing tomatoes and squash and stuff in, the, in these little greenhouses. So there are things that we can do to increase good, healthy, nutrient dense foods, but you can't start it after something happens, okay? You need to be living this type of a lifestyle now. And that's one of the keys that we want to start thinking about is doing it now before a disaster happens. So if we're eating high carb, low protein, high fat, low water food regularly, what is our body going to want to eat when something happens? The same thing. The same thing. If we suddenly switch to low carb, low fat, high protein, lots of water, what's going to happen to our bodies? We're going to feel sick. You're going to get diarrhea upset stomach, gas. <laughs> uh, my wife sent me a text the other day. Uh, my dog had crawled up on the bed and she was snuggling in for bed. And of course he passed gas and stunk up the entire room and she couldn't sleep. Well, guess what we're gonna do when we switch diets? When our bodies are used to, and there are 
bacteria and fungus that grow inside your intestines that digest your food for you. You thought we did it. Now they do it for us. They're used to a certain ratio of certain things. If we change it all of a sudden, your body's not going to like it. You're going to get sick. And if you are sick in an emergency situation, are you going to survive, thrive, or pass away? Which one do you guys think? You're not going to thrive. <laughs> you're not going to thrive. You might survive. More than likely, you're going to pass away. So let's make sure that we don't do that and start thinking about it now. It really is more of a lifestyle change. Yeah, yeah lifestyle change. There's a really good saying it says, eat what you store. It's store what you eat. And I think that really is. So with my kids, we were talking about, okay, what can we store? You know, and they got real creative with it. But um, it, was, it was really good because I'm like, okay, we can't eat it if we can't store it. Because <laughs> otherwise, you're going to not be used to the food that we have stored. As much as I love the, the most common prevalent LDS religion mindset of emergency preparedness that happens in Utah, because I'm not from Utah, so it was kind of weird for me to come here and have a community think food storage, uh, bulk wheat, bulk rice, bulk beans. Who's cooked with bulk wheat before? You've ground the wheat and you've made the bread and you've made the pasta. And how long did it take you to grind, hand grind wheat? 11 minutes. A lot of minutes <laughs> to make two cups of flour. And it's usually not very good grade flour, so you put it back through again and do it again. So, yes, ma'am. Why? Well, I know, that's why I used a hand mill, for example. But keep in mind, you're not going to have your electric neutral mill or anything else if the power's out unless you've got a power generator. You're not going to have a lot of those things. You, so you're going to have to, and, and when I've used all natural wheat to make bread and rolls, it didn't turn out like my all-purpose white flour dis, ones did. <laughs> no. Did you guys notice that? They turned out, well, like rocks. <laughs> even though I used yeast, even though I used leaveners, they just don't turn out. So if you're not used to cooking with raw ingredients, you're not going to recognize the food afterwards. And like you said, your kids need to be able to eat it. Uh, at this elevation, I thought, I'm used to Florida, below sea level, because we are, taking dry beans, putting them into a pot, soaking them for a few hours, and cooking them. Have you guys ever, ever cooked dry beans here? Yeah, how do you do it? I'm still trying to learn. Couple of days. Pressure cooker, <laughs> as, okay. <laughs> how many? Couple of days. Couple of days. Baking soda, I've heard that one helps. You don't even soak yours? Yeah. Oh. It depends on the age of the beans. Okay, age of the beans. And we're talking long-term food storage here, right? So if I crack into my five-gallon bucket of beans that's been sitting in my basement for 10 years, are those beans going to cook? They will. Eventually. <laughs> With a pressure cooker, maybe. Otherwise, when I'm done soaking them for three days and then trying to boil them and eat them, they're still going to be hard and firm. So there's different challenges in food preparation that goes along with that. But to get, so I can erase this real quick, I'm going to go back to what do you think happens to your calorie needs and your food intake needs and nutrition needs during an emergency? It goes up. How much? Significantly. Defined significantly. 30. 30, 40%, 100%, it doubles. So your normal 2,000 day calorie diet becomes a 4,000 a day calorie diet. Now, why? Stress. Stress, Stress is the biggest one. What else? We'll be doing a little more physical activity than we were before. Really? Yeah. I don't like digging a garden. I don't know. And you're What's that? You're and you're grinding wheat all day. That's not easy. <laughs> well, and you're walking everywhere. You well, why? Don't won't my car run? No. Why not? No fuel. No fuel. It'll run for a few days, right? EMP. I heard EMP. Well, I got that one covered. My little Jeep outside has got zero electrical in it. 
besides the uh, alternator. Go ahead, EMP. I'm ready. The diodes in the alternator. Diodes in the alternator. I've got replacements that are shielded. It's okay. I'm going to have a car. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but if EMP goes off, I'm going to have a car. But let's just talk about just normal natural stuff. Are our cars going to run pretty much? Yeah, as long as we have fuel for them. And even with an EMP, it's one of the big myths of an EMP, even most modern cars will stop in an EMP. Turn the key and they'll start right back up. Your power windows and your power seats and your heated seats and your defrosters won't work, but the car will still run. Plus the fact that the myth is that one EMP device set off in the United States was gonna blank out the entire United States. It's not true. It's not they true. Don't have the range. Nope. It would take about four to knock out the US. <clears throat> Not to downplay EMPs, but guys, a lot of the things that we're used to having will still work in an emergency. So what won't work is going to be things like cell phones, cell phones or uh, our, our, our plugs in the walls if the power grid goes down. Um, but our calorie intake is going to double, which means our food prep and our food consumption is going to double. And what type of ratios do you think we need to have in an emergency? We talked about what we should have to lose weight, what we eat in reality. What do you think we should have in an emergency? High carbs. High carbs. High protein. High fat. And high water. But if eating low carbs and low fat is healthy, why do we need them in an emergency? Because we're not just sitting on our butt. Stress. Did you ever wonder why farmers and pioneers and stuff, when they traveled across the oceans or the plains, they packed butter, oils, dried meats and proteins, and high carbohydrate beans and rice, and flour? Because you can store it. Really. You can store it, and it meets their nutritional needs. The same thing is going to happen to us in an emergency. We need these high calories. We need these fats. I, I always wondered why, you know, my, my grandmother and stuff would eat straight butter. I'm just thinking, straight butter. Yeah, she just walked around with a spoon of butter and eating it. They needed those calories. They needed those fats during the Depression. So she got used to it. That's what her body liked, and that's what her mind liked. We need those high calories. Click. Oh, I want to have it back up. That's right. I'm not clicking anymore. So let's talk about short-term versus long-term storage. What do you, when you think short-term storage, what kind of thing is coming to your head? Milk. Okay, milk. Milk produce canned. Freezer. Freezer, I like that one. What else? Well, for me, it, it, um, it's something quick to fix, too. OK. Because if we were talking about short-term storage, we may Fast. not have our normal cooking facilities. OK, so instant. Oh, good heavens. I've been, like I said, I've been experimenting with my little farm out there. So every so often I'll stay out in my camper as I'm building this house instead of in town with family or things like that. And I, you know, I make food like I normally do and I put it in Ziplocs and I put it in the freezer and then I go to re-prepare it and I don't have a microwave to thaw stuff out. So how do you boil food that you've put in a freezer bag and frozen it? How do you reheat it? I gave the secret away. You boil it. Okay. What else? Short term. Bread. Now, why do you think they're short term? Go ahead, explain that for me. They go rancid, don't they? They go bad. What else? Well, that's why you get Crisco. Crisco never goes bad. 
<laughs> so rather than Crisco, have you guys heard of a term called clarified butter? Who's heard of that? Raise your hands. All right, good. What is clarified butter? Okay, it's butter that's been cooked and melted to a high temperature, and then what happens to it? It removes milk solids. It removes all the milk solids. Did you know that they have opened up clay pots of clarified butter in the tombs in Egypt that was still edible? So long-term storage stuff is oils. Clarified butter is a great way to do that. What are some more short-term items that you guys use every day? Chips. Chips. Good. How long do those staples last if you don't use them? If it's in a box and you add water to it, is it long term or short term? It depends. And we'll talk about long term here in a second. But when you start thinking short term food storage, you want to start looking at items that you use on a daily basis that if you lost power would not last very long. Week to two weeks, dehydrated stuff, um, pastas, and all of these items. I'm glad somebody brought up canned goods because that's both home canned and in a can. How long do those things last? A couple years. A couple years max. So we think short term storage, I want you to think anything less than five years. Does that kind of make sense? <coughs> anything that won't last more than five years, I want you to think of it as short term storage stuff. And that's going to be a lot of your instant stuff. Because after a while, the nutritional value of all of this quick, easy to prepare stuff goes way down the drain. Uh, you can eat it. It doesn't taste bad. But remember that nutrient dense requirement we had earlier? It's just not there anymore. The, the nutrients break down. So to do long term prepared stuff, there's going to be some special requirements. What do you think those requirements are? Dry. What else? Oh, that's the wrong low. Low. <laughs> Packaging is important. Well, most solids will last longer. Wrong leg. All right, solid versus liquid. Any other major factors you can think of? Because we're going to talk about each one of these real quick. Okay, we talk talking dry. Dry versus wet. Any other major factors you guys can think of? That's all I can think of right now. Let's talk about each one real quick. Low oxygen. Why low oxygen? Things grow in oxygen. Okay, certain things need oxygen to grow. Are there things that don't need oxygen to grow? Yeah. yeah. So be careful with that one. Just because it's low oxygen doesn't mean it's totally safe. Things ferment better in low oxygen environments. You wouldn't have wine or beer or sauerkraut or kimchi <laughs> if it had oxygen. Okay? You'd have vinegar and fertilizer for your garden for all the rest <laughs> of the stuff okay it's going to rot and spoil so even though uh, low oxygen is important because oxygen causes what to go bad any ideas why oxygen is so bad it makes fat go bad so if your long-term storage items have an oil in it it needs to be low oxygen and usually the best ways to get a low oxygen environment is nitrogen and carbon dioxide purging. Okay, they will fill the container with nitrogen or carbon dioxide because they're heavier than air and they'll push the air out and get all the oxygen out. So make sure that whenever you get long-term storage products, freeze dried, whatever, do it yourself, purge it with some sort of gas that's going to be heavier than air, so all the air gets out, all the oxygen gets out. Or add oxygen absorbers. 
Any idea where those come from? What those are? Iron. It's iron. Iron oxide. Okay? Rust. What they are literally doing is rusting. And you can buy those wonderful little packets of oxygen absorbers to drop in your stuff. And if you've got a really big container, there's a really cheap way to do that. Any ideas? Dry ice. Dry ice. Nails. But nails taste bad. <laughs> and as things rush in your food, your food's going to taste like rust. Who's ever used those little hand warmers that you pop open, you're supposed to air and they get warm? Guess what's happening? It's using oxygen to create heat. So open up a hand warmer, mush it around, get it activated, drop it in with your grains and stuff. It will absorb all the oxygen in that container, just like your little oxygen absorber packets. But they're usually not cheaper, but for a big container, they're much more efficient. So low oxygen, either get the oxygen out or replace it with something else that's not going to cause your fats to go bad. That's why those things last for 25 years. One strategy too of our getting oxygen out is if you have the right equipment, is the vacuum. Vacuum sealers. If you can both vacuum seal it, well, even better, purge it with a gas, suck out all that gas too, you now have less weird, funny taste in your food. Absolutely, vacuum sealers. What else? Anything else for low gas? That's all I can think of right now. Vacuum sealers in conjunction with the oxygen absorbers? Is the best way to do it. That's one thing that, uh, that does drive me nuts about every single commercial package that I've seen. There's gas inside here, space. These are nitrogen purged. That's why they last 25 years. There's no oxygen in here, but they're fluffy. You could use it as a pillow if you wanted to. I keep waiting and, I, and I've written in suggestions to these guys and they said, well, we'll, we'll consider that. Vacuum pack these. Purge it and vacuum pack it and it's half, because the food only comes to about right here. Why is it this big? It's a marketing item. Oh, oh, that's a huge bag. I'm getting tons of food. And I can use it for a pillow. And I can use it for a pillow. <laughs> and it's resealable. So that's a great container. And it is. These, these meet almost all of my requirements for long-term food storage. Low oxygen, store in a cool environment, the good container, um, solid versus wet, store it in a dry place. I love these. And they don't taste that bad. They taste pretty good. Did you guys eat some? Try some after class. I would really encourage you to. You'll be surprised. But they're bulky. So they're hard to store. I like things in small amounts. Um, cool. How do we get things cool besides a freezer? Root cellar. Root cellar. How many of you have root cellars? How many of you have seen a root cellar? Been inside one? Then why don't you have one? <laughs> have you tried digging a hole in Iron County? <laughs> I have. I went to Home Depot and I borrowed their little Kubota tractor and I used the backhoe and I dug a hole <laughs> because I was sure I wasn't going to do it by hand. I hit like three or four different layers of compacted cement hard sand and clay and rocks. Awesome. Yeah, caliche. Okay, so I was like, I'm not doing this by hand to back that. So I rented a tractor and I dug a hole and I have a root cellar. Root cellars are, do we all have basements? What is a basement? It's a root cellar. So find a spot. How, how many of you have basements with a poured cement front porch? The cold room underneath it. Uh, my house here in town, my wife thought I was crazy when I took a concrete blade to the wall in our basement. She's like, you're destroying our house. And I cut into that space underneath my front porch and it was probably 38 degrees inside there, just under 40 degrees. What temperature is your fridge supposed to be at? 40 degrees or less. So everything we had in our refrigerator, we could put in that cold room under my front porch and still be just fine. So start thinking about geothermal cooling. What else did they use before we had refrigerators? Ice. Ice. 
Can ice last through the summer? Most certainly can. You pack it in sawdust. Under hay, sawdust, something like that. Pack it in sawdust. That's what the old ice houses used to do. They'd go to Penguin Lake and they'd saw through that three feet of ice and they'd make blocks three feet by three feet. They'd pack them in sawdust and by September, <laughs> they're about a foot and a half by a foot and a half, but it's still ice. So yes, you can store ice over the summer. What about dry versus wet? Do dry things store better than wet things? Are there some wet things that store better than dry things? Water. Water. <laughs> honey. Who's had honey from 20 years ago? It was hard as a rock, wasn't it? It was all crystallized and uh, hard as a rock. So what'd you do to it to make it honey again? He heated it. And what happened to it as soon as you stopped heating it? It went back to it turned into rock candy, didn't it? So when you heat honey from crystallized, make sure you add some of that water back to it. It's dehydrated. It, it's been evaporated it out. So add some of that water back to it. But honey is a great wet liquid that stores great. Why dark? Any ideas? Sure. Sunlight deteriorates everything. Okay. Ultraviolet. It's the ultraviolet radiation and, and that. It breaks down the nutrients in your food. Sunlight's going to fight the cool. Sunlight's going to fight the cool as well. So we need cool and dark and dry. Who's gone into your basement up against the walls, the cement walls? Did it feel dry or moist? Did you guys notice that? Who's touched a bare concrete wall on the underground? Moist. It's moist. <coughs> it stores moisture. So whenever you store these things, the container that it is in is going to help keep it more dry than anything else. So what type of things do we want in the container? Sturdy. Sturdy, durable. Waterproof. Waterproof. Rodent proof. I was waiting for that one. Oh my gosh. Did you know that a rat can chew through an inch and a half of concrete? Yeah. Concrete. You'd think, oh, their teeth would wear away. They do. They keep growing. Their teeth never stop. They're like rabbits. All rodents. Their teeth don't stop growing. They can also eat through metal containers, which is totally asinine. So keep some animal pest control, something or other, safely stored in your storage. So how do you do that? What is a food safe pest control? Yeah. A good cat. <laughs> except, oh. Oh, I probably shouldn't tuck the mic so much. For me, cats are great target practice. <laughs> I'm not a cat person. Okay, so the idea of having cats, and my kids are allergic to cats. So for me to have cats around to eat mice and stuff is just not going to work. What else? Traps. Traps. Diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth. I love that one. Teeny tiny shellfish from a long time ago that died and now keep us alive. It discourages them. And other pests, like weevils. Oh, weevils don't like it at all. But we can put a slight dusting of diatomaceous earth over your grain in a bucket. And when you use it, shake it, filter it out. It's not going to hurt us, but it's good for us. Yeah, it's good for us. It's okay. But it will keep all the weevils and bugs and stuff from eating the grains that you've got stored. Non-chemical ways of doing stuff. Yeah, it saves your garden from slugs and, and other pesticides. All bugs. All bugs. It's, it's great stuff. Diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous. Spell me, how many have some diatomaceous? Help me out, guys. A-C-O-M-A-C-E-O-U-S. A-C-E-O-U-S. Okay. Diatomaceous earth. Great little supplement. Mothballs. Okay? Get as high naphtha content as you can. Just toss one or two in your basement. It'll smell a little funny when you go in there, but there won't be any bugs in your, in your food storage. For containers, I hate to say this, but you want high density polyethylene plastics. Emphasis on the high density. 
because mice can chew through concrete and they can chew through aluminum and they can chew through tin. So they have trouble chewing through plastic because it's so resilient. So high density, because bad things happen with food and low density products. They leach a bunch of stuff into it. And these will too. So what do we need inside those high density containers? Mylar. Okay, line all of your cans and buckets and stuff with mylar. It will keep the weird funky chemicals that keep the, the rodents out from getting into your food. And then purge it with something. What was it? Nitrogen, carbon dioxide, CO2, whatever. Um, keep it cool, keep it dry, keep it dark. One of the key things that you always want to look at if you're buying packaged stuff is if you take a flashlight and put it to it, you should see no light coming through the package. Because if there's light getting in, what's happening to your food inside? Getting it's getting old and degrading. So use a little bit of you know, common sense as you're doing stuff. So that's how and where to store it. What about food prep? How are you going to prepare your food in an emergency? Over the fireplace. I love that. Who has an actual working wood fireplace chimney in your home? Or do you have a gas insert or wood stove? Okay. About half the room. I was so glad when we bought our house here in town that it has two chimneys. One upstairs and one downstairs. The one upstairs has a fireplace. That's a real fireplace. And the one downstairs was covered over. <laughs> But being a firefighter, I saw it from the outside and said, huh, there's a chimney there. I'm going to go find it. I found, tore through the walls, found the chimney, and I put in a wood-burning stove downstairs. Who's cooked on a wood-burning stove before? How did it go? Hard. Turned out great? Hard. <laughs> did it when you were a kid. Okay. There's a learning curve to it. Shame on you. Burn kind of thing. Is it a wood pellet one? No. Okay, it's wood. Yeah. But it's, but it's got a fire thick fire. exterior. Okay. Uh, where's the thermostat on a wood stove or a fireplace? Damper. Okay, it's your damper. How accurate is that? Can I go? The, the directions say cook this in a pot at 325 degrees for 15, 20 minutes. Can you do that on in a fireplace? <laughs> no. Can you do it on a wood stove? Sometimes, if you got a thermometer. So there's a learning curve to cooking on some of these more primitive heat sources. You can cook it in the coals, too. You can cook it in the coals. And again, where's your thermostat? You don't need one. You just do a Dutch oven and Well, then why do we need thermostats on our ovens? Why can't we just turn it on high and put stuff in there? Well, ovens are different. Turn it up. They are different, OK? So the way that we're used to cooking is going to be different when we don't have power. You have a rocket stove. Excellent. So these are some of your options. You've got fireplace, wood stove, uh, rocket stoves, solar. How long does it take to cook a roast in a solar oven? Two days. Actually, here at, at, our, at our latitude, we actually get pretty good sunlight. We get, in the summer, we get um, 8 to 12, what they call peak hours of daylight a day. And any idea what kind of temperature it gets inside of a solar oven? Mm -hmm. Three to 500 degrees. Gosh dang it, that's like our ovens. So how long does it take you to cook a roast in your oven? About, the same. about, an, about an hour and a half, two hours? I want to know where you're going to get a roast in the grid down situation. Don't worry about cooking it. Well... <laughs> I don't know about you, but there's a reason why I live way out on Lund Highway, away from everybody else, and everybody else is within rifle range. Because on my little ranch, I have livestock. You You're welcome. I'm an excellent shot. <laughs> okay. Um, roasts come from animals, sustainable animals. One of the fastest growing animals that we have rabbits and goats okay I love eating my rabbits not only do I get 
And rabbit, by the way, has the highest protein content of any meat source that we have. It's 27% protein and almost no fat, which is why you get rabbit starvation. You gotta have the fats. So I have raised chickens. So you got fats from the eggs and rabbits and goats. That's all the red meat and white meat that you could stand. Plus eggs. Plus eggs. And feathers for your bed and furs to stay warm. And good heavens, don't, don't get me started. Solar. <laughs> Why hasn't anybody said gas yet? I have a barbecue grill. Okay. How long will propane last? <laughs> Depends on how much you have stored. Those little 20 pound tanks don't last very long. But the 120 gallon tank that I have out on, by my cabin lasts me all year. So if you have bulk propane, you may be able to last a year or two if you use it wisely. What are the laws with the, having the, the big tank of propane? How anything, far is your house and how? anything larger than 120 gallons must be at least 50 feet away from a home, a residence, a structure but the 120 gallon tanks, they can put right up next to your house. And they're about this big around and about this tall. So they're not that expensive. They're not that bad. Uh, I believe Amerigas charges uh, 99 cents per gallon and they don't charge for the tank. So if you tell them, hey, I'm gonna put one here at my house, they'll come out, they'll put it out, they'll help you stub it out to your house. And then if you never open it and never have them come refill it, you have almost a year's supply of gas at your home. Matt, you said how big is that? 120 gallons. gallons. And it doesn't go bad. And it doesn't go bad. So if you want to be able to use your stove and things, and you've got a gas range, gas oven, grill, start thinking about maybe storing some propane. Generator. Generators. Generators. How long do those go? Cal Ranch sells one that runs on gas or propane. Gas or propane. And the adapter kits are very reasonable. Um, what else? Charcoal. Charcoal. <laughs> Santa comes and brings down and gets charcoal kits. <laughs> Did you guys know there used to be a coal mine here? Yes. Do you know where it is? <laughs> I'm not telling. <laughs> There were, there were four that I know of here in this area uh, that are closed mines. But guess it, what happens when you go for a hike and you collect rocks on your hike? Black rocks. You can get a lot of coal in this area still. What about long-term storage of charcoal or coal? Is there an issue with that? Or? None whatsoever. Okay. Keep it dry. Keep it dry. So it's light, yeah. Gosh darn it, cool, dry, out of sunlight. I was just going to say, the research that I read on charcoal says that if you have 15 five-gallon buckets of charcoal mm -hmm. stored, that that's enough to give you at least one hot-cooked meal a day or a year. Okay. Typically. So I hadn't heard that, but that's, that's good to know. Yeah, well, 15 five-gallon mm -hmm. five buckets. So, you know, get your basic five-gallon bucket, fill it full of charcoal. Um, Walmart is that briquettes or is that? The, it's the briquettes. Okay. Not the lump coal. I was about to say the lump charcoal is not going to last that no, long. And it cannot be match light or anything it's like that. Yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. you don't want but you're right. You want to make sure you get the non match light stuff. Get the hard to light stuff. At Walmart puts it on right before every Labor Day for a killer sale. It's yeah. the cheapest way to do it. Double giant bags. Yeah, double giant bags. And it's just easy to dump into the bucket and seal it up. and. You know, preferably store it not in your house, but it's not an issue like a lot of other things. You could store it in the garage, but it's everything there. <laughs> so coal does not lose its uh, BTU? It's been around for about 15 million years so far. They haven't found an expiration date for coal. <laughs> well, but I know, but usually it's underground. I mean, if you... Even stored up top. Nope. So Last grain. Mm -hmm. turned into diamonds. Hey, you go. <laughs> you go through enough but stress, enough pressure, enough <laughs> and you'll have really valuable firewood. <laughs> okay. Um, in Arizona, you can cook anything in your car. That's right. I, 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 you, you laugh, but that is a type of solar oven, okay? You're absolutely right. Solar ovens, your car. I, I've been camping, and I have put stuff in my car to preheat and pre-warm. My friends put cookies on the desk. And there's a book out there that teaches you how to, how to do a rotisserie chicken on your engine block. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
I don't know about you, but I have spilt enough oil and stuff in my engine compartment that I'm not sure I want to eat that rotisserie chicken. Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah, sometimes we forget, too, that you can cook just over an open fire. And your wood, you can use just like charcoal. You can put them all, uh, get your coals going and put them on top of your Dutch oven. Yep. It works, really well. it works just well. I love your Kelly kettle. That one's well, it, that's the thing is that we, we talked about uh, what, what I have up here, rocket stove. The Kelly kettle is based on the principle of a rocket stove. And it is the fastest way that I have found to heat water, period. It's a rocket stove for those of us who are unenlightened. Okay, we're, well, we're right at the time limit, right, uh, Steve? Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna take it real quick. We're gonna draw the principle of a rocket stove on, on the board, and then the class will officially end so we can stop the video. But if you guys wanna keep talking and stuff afterwards, that's totally fine. We, we can share information. A rocket stove is based off of, you ready for this? Native American Indian technology. What's the, uh, it's called a Dakota hole. Yeah, yeah. It's called a Dakota hole. And the idea was that you find a little bit of a slope and you dig a hole. And then you dig another hole that meets the bottom. and you build your fire right here. Now what this does, and it's amazing, the primitive technologies that incorporate normal modern day physics. Convection, hot air rises, cold air sinks, yeah? So you start out with a few sticks up here and you build your fire right here. Like a regular small little teepee fire. It burns through these sticks and once it gets going, it burns through and you knock it down until it falls into the bottom. This causes the hot air in here to rise, which causes a vacuum negative pressure inside the space, which now sucks in cold air from the outside and it cycles. Just like, so, a, just like a chimney. It's exactly the same way that your chimney works. It's a convection of principle. Hot air rises, cold air goes in the bottom and replaces it. Who's ever had a fire where you needed to blow on it to keep it going? You don't have good air circulation, okay? This optimizes super efficiently your air circulation. Plus, if you dig this hole straight, you take a stick and you put it in at the bottom of the fire and as the fire burns, you can continue to push that stick in. And it will make coals and keep heat going right here. Someone took that idea and said, well, I wanna make it portable. So they made a rocket stove. That's all it is. It's using the natural physics and principles that we have already to speed up and increase the heat of this fire. The cool thing about this fire, why the Indians loved it so much, is because you couldn't see it from about 15 feet away, you can't see it. Right over this hole, they'd put a few rocks and they'd cook over it. And it is 300, 400 degrees coming out of that hole. No smoke. It burns so hot, so efficiently that all the smoke that comes off, by the way, smoke is 80% of the BTUs contained in your wood. It's fuel. So if your fire is smoking, it's not burning efficiently. Going up in smoke. It's going up. <laughs> exactly. That's where the phrase comes from. Your resources are literally going up in smoke. So these rocket stoves are amazing, and the Kelly kettles the same thing. They're very fuel efficient. Mm -hmm. They take your supply, but they just turn into ten-year supply if you can make it with a rocket stove. And they're also there's almost no heat loss because you've got it going through a small chimney. Unlike cooking on an open fire, this contains your heat and it warms your water. And the reason why it boils your water so fast is because of surface area. Water as a substance can only absorb so much heat so fast. So no matter, that's why no matter how hot you turn your burner on in your, on your stove, the water takes seven minutes to boil, okay? That's just the way it is. Water can only absorb heat so fast. But by increasing the surface area inside, I have seen these boil water in four or five minutes. 
Okay. And so we put the two together, so you got your opening here, so your airflow that he pointed out there in that side hole is coming through, and your heat is coming. You got that L shape, very similar to the Dakota fire, and the water's jacketed in here. So, so here's the benefit: the water insulates and contains the heat. They make them all the way from half a liter up to three liters. That sounds about right, yeah. In capacity. They make the, they're, they're different sizes for different purposes. But you can do this similar things with rocks on a campsite or tin cans. There's all different kinds of things you can do. But this is a great, great tool to have. And with the Killy Kettle, the support fins go in the top. While I'm boiling water, I could actually be heating a meal as well. And again, it insulates it so well that the air coming out the top is 400 degrees. There's no smoke. It uses yeah. very little fuel. Okay. It burns it all efficiently. And it's, it's, a, it's a great device. It's a great idea. These rocket stove ideas, you'll find them in uh, five gallon paint buckets. They've made them out of concrete. Uh, you can find them out of cement block, out of uh, four inch steel. There's all different kinds of stuff that you can do to use this principle. Tin cans. I, I've got a tin can one that I designed, called, and it's oof. There's a lot of science in it, but if you want to talk about it afterwards, I'm more than happy to do that. You can do flower pots. Anything that's going to cause this circulatory method of air, hot air going out, cold air coming in, is a rocket stove. Super efficient, great way to cause heat. You can do it with a bundle of twigs, and that's it. You don't need firewood. Uh, it's frustrating because. I use this principle to build the, the masonry wood heater for my cabin. And I'm used to splitting logs and stuff for firewood and having firewood chunks. And now I split kindling because my firebox is 12 inches by 12 inches by 18 inches. That's it. Harbor Freight has a manual log splitter. It's a hydraulic that yep. you use with handles. And so you don't need any fuel, electricity, or anything to split logs. Really. You can turn them over and split them as small as you want. Yeah, mine's called my kids. <laughs> We use them all. All right, guys. So time for the class is kind of done. Any questions about what we've covered today so far? Anything that came up that you were like, huh? Mylar bags. Yes, sir. Did you put those in one of those vacuum sealers? Yep. And they will seal. And they, will seal. And they make portable. That's a good question. They make portable hand sealers. They're called irons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you have an iron, put it on high. And you go, bzzz, and you can seal those Mylar bags right back up. Just don't let it sit for too long because then you get Mylar stuck to your iron. But if you run it along at a nice, smooth, even speed, you will seal those Mylar bags up just fine. Your vacuum sealers, like the food savers, stuff like that, those all will seal it. Uh, and they actually do make little battery-operated sealers that you can just grip to reseal potato chip bags. And Mylar, <laughs> zip, close them right up. Okay, if you're putting a whole bunch of sealed bags into like a bucket to seal up, uh -huh. do you need them to be mylar as far as the, the, the bags that you put the food in or should be the regular sealing type bags? They can be the regular sealing type bags. Uh, just keep in mind that the mylar with that metallic outside and inside layer gives you a little bit of extra protection against the chemicals inside the plastic buckets. And you can get food grade buckets, guys, that don't have those chemicals in them. Um, just do your research. Um, so you don't have to have Mylar, but it is so cheap and it's the best one to use. Yeah, you're better off using Mylar. Um, how do you tell if the bucket's food grade? Yeah, ask. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of times they say, oh, it could be and it could not be. It could not be. So, then, so them buy them and them find them a are. different source. Yeah, but, but there's. Generally speaking, if you're getting food in a plastic bucket from the grocery stores, the all that happens like Western Foods over here on, on Airport Road, they, get, they, they go through thousands of buckets of stuff every day that had food grade stuff in it. Those buckets are food grade buckets. And a lot of the times they're low cost or free to the public. They will give them